All right, welcome everybody. We're here with David Childers from KCM. That's Keeping Current Matters. Check them out. They're always bringing us the best information about real estate, whether it's trends or just real estate information that we need to share with our clients. So David, again, thanks. We're doing this every other week and we wanna keep yep. everybody informed about the market. Thanks for joining us, buddy. You got it. It's fun. This is the, uh, you know, we, we were just catching up before this on, you know, it's now been, gosh, five and a half months since all of this started and we've done several of these, but to be doing them every couple of weeks now is, uh, is fun. I enjoy every chance I get to spend time with you and spend time just with the lab coat community. So thanks for having me back and, and I'm excited. Well, dude, honestly, it's needed, man, because everything switched so quickly. Yeah. Like I, I'm excited to see what you got for us today. Where do you want to start? Yeah, so I brought a few things. You know, I, I was looking at uh, what we talked about a couple a couple weeks ago, and you know, what's most recent is Friday. The unemployment report came out, so I'll give you kind of a, a little bit of a Ooh. look at that, a breakdown there. So we'll talk about that. Like uh, that. We'll talk about foreclosures. It was something that we talked about last time that I told you I'd bring back some more information, and then I thought we would we'd spend a little bit of time talking about prices as well, and just looking at what's going on with. Pricing, I love that. In uh, the forecast, really, for pricing going forward. So uh, that's what we've got on tap. But as always, if people have questions, if people have things they want to throw in there, we can we can look at those and grab things from those. We'll take any questions. I always say, you know, as long as I, I, I reserve the right to say I don't know, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my goal is to bring to everybody, uh, you know, the data and the, the information they need to be the knowledge broker where they're at. So uh, perfect, man. Well, yeah. Let's get this going. Tell me where do you want to start? Unemployment or? Yeah, let's start with unemployment. That's where that's where we were. Uh, you know, Friday morning. I'll show you a few uh, visuals relative to that to kind of kind of kick the story off, and we can have a little bit of dialogue about it. Uh, and really, I think these these images here, Tristan, I would offer. You know, maybe some people want to share, maybe they don't, but I, I would say use this information to be educated in the market right now as yeah. you know objections come up or questions come up about unemployment this is really what we're trying to do is is, is give you the, the the factual data behind what's going on so with that as a backdrop I'll share my screen here and this is, is kind of a simplified look here what we try to do is we try to break things down to simple and effective uh, visuals so that you can use those and share those with your clients but this is a complete look at unemployment numbers in orange there you see the number 58.9 it's 58 8.9 million uh, people that have cumulatively cumulatively filed for unemployment benefits. So uh, okay. that's all of the you know folks since the beginning of this that have said, "Hey, my work has been uh, you know either temporary or permanently uh, uh, compromised, and I need to apply for unemployment benefits." Now, the interesting thing is the blue line there is those currently collecting unemployment. You can see that it's just over 13 million. Uh, in, in this country right now as of latest number. So just to give you some perspective on who's filed and the cumulative number, that number's you know, gonna, gonna go up, but, but we wanna see those currently collecting unemployment continue to go down. I'm not suggesting that 13 million people collecting unemployment's a good thing. Uh, we, we wanna see that continue to, to drop. And if you know, one person or one family is affected by unemployment, uh, that's too many, so. Uh, well, David, look, we, look at the line going up, the blue line, where it started, uh, what was that? Let, let's just say the 21st there, because it's there. And then... About the third week in March. Okay, yeah, third week in March, it goes up steadily, and then beginning of May, it kind of starts going down, right? Yeah. What happened at that point? Anything anything that happened that we can be educated on? Well, I think that that's really the time around quarantine, you know? So, so as we saw things happen around the middle of March, quarantine hit up until about the middle of May. And that's when, you know, people could, could you know, try to come out safely after that. And, and certainly not all states or all areas and all businesses immediately opened up at that point, but that was the starting point when they could begin to, to get back out. Got it. So there was somewhat of a solution to our current situation. They're like, okay, let's, Correct. let's get to work in this manner. All right. Yeah, right. Good point. And, and, I, and I think we're still right. in, in, a, in an element of that as well to where, you know, you know, the things that have been compromised in this are production, you know, just the literally the volume of goods that businesses can turn out. And then, you know, can they uh, continue to do that and, and do it at a rate that they did prior to to what um, uh, what was going on prior to the pandemic. So if, if we look back to Friday, uh, I, I grabbed a quick quote from Jason Furman at Harvard. 
Uh, an unemployment rate of 8.4%, which is what was published Friday morning, is much lower than most anyone would have thought it a few months ago. So lower than what folks were thinking a few months ago, and we'll talk about that in just a second, Tristan. We talked a lot about that, you know, several months ago when we started this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes on to say it's still a bad recession, but not historically un uh, uh, unprecedented event or one we need to go back to the Great Depression for comparison. So again, you know, just a few months ago, we were comparing unemployment to the Great Depression. We're in a very different situation here as we, you know, as we start the month of September off with an unemployment rate of 8.4%. Again, still high, but not anywhere near what we saw in uh, you know, depression error levels. Very true, man, I love that. Yeah. Uh, the big story coming out of, of Friday is the economy gained 1.4 million jobs. And uh, again, want to see all these jobs come back to, um, to folks that want them, that need them, that, 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 are, that are getting out there and working. You can see where the, the breakdown is here. Government jobs coming back. These are local municipalities, courthouses, things that are opening back up. Um, retail jobs coming back as people are back into um, you know, stores and areas where they can shop. And you can see across the, uh, the line there uh, of each one of the categories. But uh, seeing jobs come back in the market, seeing 1.4 million jobs come back uh, in the last month is a very, very good thing. You know, I think the kind of going back to your earlier uh, comment, Tristan, the story of unemployment is that it rose in March and April. And as we started to turn the corner, and I'm certainly not saying we're out of the pandemic, don't, don't hear me say that, but as businesses could get back to work, we've seen the unemployment rate drop from you know, April to May, May to June, June to July, and, and ultimately here in August, uh, the, the most recent monthly number where we come in at 8.4%. So good news there for, for unemployment. We wanna send that, see that continue to drop. There, there are many questions, many issues that, um, uh, that we face relative to unemployment as a country that we have to figure out. But uh, seeing it drop is a, a thing I think we can all agree on is a good thing. Um, this one slide before I, I pause here, if you remember this, we always want to look at depth and length of unemployment. So we started looking at this back several months ago when we would do these calls and, you know, we want to see how much unemployment are we, how far are we going down and for how long? You know, the gray bar there represents the Great Depression, the blue bar represents the Great Recession, and then the red is actually where we stand and then the orange is you know, what the projections are. And it looks very different today, you know, than what it did before where we saw, you know, significant unemployment around uh, April and May. And, uh, and, and now we're seeing that come down and not last nearly as long as a great recession or the great depression. So good news there relative to, to unemployment, still, uh, you know, a need for more people to get jobs back, still a need for businesses to get back to production levels. No doubt businesses, you know, aren't going to make it through this. Some, uh, you know, are going to, going to say, you know, we're going to shut the doors. But, uh, but, but seeing people get back to work is what what we're up to right now. So I have a question. If you can go back to that previous graph, sure. The depth and length. Yeah, the depth and length. So you see that you've got the the Great Depression came back uh, sharply, right? Mm -hmm. And the Great Recession it took a hell of a long time to recover. Nine years. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it that they're thinking it's going to, we're going to recover four years? Do we know any information as to why four years? Why not two years? Why not three? Well, I, I think the, the, the quick answer for that is this is a external health crisis that's affecting the economy. There's not a fundamental issue inside the economy. Now, if you remember back in 2008, our business was at the epicenter of the downturn. We all remember that, mm -hmm. that we're in the business. Even if you weren't in the business, you remember that. Um, and that was a systemic challenge with credit and banks and lending and, you know, uh, all the things that we've talked about. Now we're dealing with an economy that has been, has been moving along, but, you know, was literally the pause button was pressed due to the fear of people getting sick. And so yeah. as that pause button can be, um, you know, unpressed, for lack of a better word, business can continue on that. Now, I think that the question out there right now is what are the effects over the next couple of years that, you know, are caused during this that will, that will hang around. Um, but, but even in those effects, that's going to happen. Um, we're seeing much better 
forecast than what we saw in, in 2008 relative to unemployment. All right. I, I also think that that recovery, I know it's like a four-year recovery line altogether, right? It could, I think, even come back sooner, depending on how fast we turn around with the vaccine and how it's spread out, right? So, yeah, I think that's that's uh, the um, you know the, the question is if tomorrow a vaccine is discovered or you know therapeutics are are enhanced, then yeah, this changes a lot of this. It's going to come down to when do people feel confident being out and you know out and about and doing things like that. I don't think you know tomorrow people are going to get out and go see a movie or people are going to all pile on an airplane uh, shortly thereafter. So um, uh, th that's one of the questions that that as we go through this will have to be answered and and will be answered largely to to the degree people feel comfortable and that is you know to your point vaccine or uh, you know, drugs that are available. Very true. All right. There's a question here, but I don't know if you know the answer. I don't know the answer to this one, Lorenzo. I think it is. It's relative. I saw it pop up in here. It's relative to the discrepancy and what they talk about in, uh, in, in the way that they're recording unemployment. Is All right. That, is that, so, that's the question? Yeah, I that's it. Got it. How do they calculate the new jobs claims? Yeah, there's there, there's two things that 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 happened during the the pandemic. First is on a monthly basis, if you recall, they've talked about okay, we may be overstating, and and if you think about that conversation, this was the challenge with people: are they permanently unemployed? Are they temporarily unemployed? And how they respond to the survey. Um, you know, if you look at marginal uh, differences, the way they would calculate it, you, you would see a slight tick up in unemployment in the rate. Um, I would say it's, it's on some level immaterial because it's not the story. Unemployment is coming down. But there is al there's always been debate about how we track unemployment in this country. There will always be debate about how we track unemployment uh, in this country. And so our team is watching those, but I think the bigger narrative overshadows those, those things of, um, at the end of the day, unemployment is improving, but there has been some some talk of the way they count things, and you know the shift of it might be you know half a percent higher if you were to look at it a, a different way. All right, dude, good answer. All right, so what else do you got for us now that we've got a little bit of unemployment in our face? We understand it a little better on recovery. Sure. I'm excited to see those numbers, man. I, I love seeing the the trajectory of everything right. in regards to unemployment going down steadily. And that's what we want to see. You, you know, we want to see more people get back to work. We want to see more businesses operate. We want to see more people do what they do. And, and I think right now with regard to business, look at our business. It's uh, this, this downturn, economically speaking, is being defined by innovation. You know, our ability to, uh, you know, go out and, and close a transaction or do what we need to do in a transaction. It took us a long time in our business where we said we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, and all of a sudden come to find out we can. Uh, right. And so I think other businesses, we certainly don't uh, have a monopoly on innovation in the real estate business, but I think other businesses, restaurants are figuring this out, other businesses are figuring out how to get back to, uh, to businesses um, as they would like. So let's talk for a minute because this is the question that comes up now. And, and again, we talked about this last time. I, I don't know if this is a question that um, everybody necessarily knocks on your door and says, hey, I have a question about how unemployment is going to affect foreclosures. But I think it's out there. I think that, you know, certainly um, uh, when folks are in challenging times relative to employment, then you go, okay, look, there, there are going to be foreclosures. So let's take a look at that. I prepared some information kind of coming off our last conversation, pulled a, a quote here from Odetta Cushy from uh, First American, and, and this is important. Uh, she says, economic distress and a lack of equity are the two triggers of foreclosure. Let me read that again. Economic distress and a lack of equity are the two triggers of foreclosure. Each trigger by itself is necessary but not sufficient for foreclosure. The percentage of economically distressed homeowners, homeowner households is highest in COVID-19 hotspots where they're, you, you know, we're seeing more of the virus. However, the equity built up since the Great Recession can provide an important buffer for distressed homeowners. So as we see unemployment high, uh, that, that certainly is one of the triggers 
The mm -hmm. other trigger is a lack of equity in homes. Now, we talked a lot about this on the front end of the uh, of these conversations several months ago, how 42.1% of the homes in this country are owned free and clear. 587 have greater than 60% equity in this country. There's significant equity lessons that were learned back in the housing crash that hopefully gives people um, you know, the, the space to be able to weather the storm financially because there are going to come uh, uh, times where people have to say, look, we can't continue on this way. And, and hopefully, unlike 2008, they can sell the home, put some money in their pocket and move on versus having to walk away when they literally owe more on it uh, than, uh, than what it's worth. So starting to see some reporting come out on this. Uh, the next piece comes from Bankrate, um, from Jeff Ostroqui. Uh, he's a senior uh, poor, uh, mortgage reporter there. He says, the COVID-19 pandemic will lead to a rise in mortgage defaults and foreclosures. Okay, so what we're saying here, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna lead to a rise, not, a, not this wave, um, but as the housing market muscles through this economic downturn, it looks as if foreclosures will form a trickle rather than a flood. So that was the big fear, is that are we going to see what we saw in 2008 when we saw, uh, you know, tremendous numbers of properties come to market in distressed fashion? Um, and, and with the equity situation, with, with what we see across the country, th this analysis is, this, yeah, they will, um, but, but nothing like we saw in 2008. It goes on in that, in that article uh, to say in the first half of 2010, 1.65 million American homes went into foreclosure, according to Adam data. In the first half of 2020, barely 165,000 loans were hit with foreclosure action. Even if defaults rise dramatically, they'll remain well below the levels seen during the mortgage meltdown. So we're, we're, at, a, we're at a time in this this country where, um, can you see me again? I, I want to change the slide there. Yeah, We're at a time in this country where foreclosures and defaults are at a all time low. Even as compared, you look at, you look back at the significant defaults back in 2010, 1.65 million, the first half, we're at 10% of that right now. The reason for that is there's been a moratorium on beginning foreclosure proceeding, proceedings. So as people come out of forbearance, as that moratorium is lifted, we're going to see more foreclosures. It happens every month, every year in our business. Unfortunately, people can't pay their mortgage and a foreclosure proceeding mm -hmm. begins. But, but what we don't see and what he's saying here is a flood of those uh, foreclosures. More, more, his words were a trickle. So very interesting there uh, relative to, to foreclosures. I love the information, dude, because a lot of people freak out, right? Yeah. And yeah. so the good, here's one thing I've noticed that's been really good for, for the real estate world. The media has been on board and saying, we're not going into foreclosure. Homes, they're, they're, they're actually reporting great news and saying, look, in some markets, it's the opposite. Things are selling quicker. Right. Things, things are not lasting on the market at all. And it's because there's low inventory, right? And so... I think this time they're taking a different avenue, which is great because as soon as they start reporting, oh my gosh, you know, the world's going to fall apart, everybody starts believing it more, right? Yeah. I think the, you know, like one thing we always say is we can't give you tomorrow's news, but I would be prepared for headlines that reach, that, that read foreclosures are on the rise because that, that is going to happen. I would argue at this point, that's not news. We stopped foreclosures in this country, and now we're going we're, we're gonna to allow them to happen again. They're going to rise. So let's be prepared for that. Let's understand it. And, and let's also understand that we're at a historically low number in this country of foreclosures. If that number, let me give you a scenario. I want to bring a, I'll bring a visual in here. This is a look at the number of consumers with new foreclosures going back to 1999. You see the big, you know, kind of, uh, bell in the middle there, that's the housing crisis when we saw a significant yeah. number of foreclosures. Now, our team drew here a, a line at 150,000 per quarter and call that sort of a normalized market. We, are, uh, we sit in the first quarter of 2020 at 74,000, almost 75,000 
uh, new foreclosure proceedings. If that were to number, if that number were to double, and we saw the headline foreclosures in this country just doubled, that would bring us back into a normalized market relative to foreclosures. Now, I'm certainly not, I'm not sitting here saying, I think the number of foreclosures is about to double. Don't hear me say that. But I'm saying if it did, if that was the worst case scenario, it would bring us very much into a, uh, a, a normalized market relative to foreclosures uh, across the country. All right. That makes makes a lot of sense. I love that graph, by the way. Is that graph in the free side of KCM or do people have to subscribe to KCM to get that one? You can go grab this on Instagram. If you're not following KCM on Instagram, I would follow KCM. We've used this graph. I'll send it to you, Tristan. We can post it somewhere. I want everybody to have it uh, so they have access to it. But this is the information we need to help consumers understand because they have questions about it. And I think they're, they're legitimate questions to say, okay, you know, I hear things about unemployment. I hear things potentially about foreclosures. I remember 2008 and being able to, to, to show them this is kind of what's going on is, is, you know, what we need to do right now. I agree, dude. There's a great question by Ira saying, to the unemployment count, are furloughed people included in unemployment? So uh, depends on furloughed, what, what would mean by that. So temporary, yes. Um, so if you're, if you're, considered temporarily unemployed, meaning my boss says we're not working right now, we're gonna be back at a certain point. Yes, those are counted uh, in, in the numbers. All right, perfect, dude. All right, good, put that one up there. All right, what do you got for us next? Was that, I thought we had one more on the topic here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk um, uh, just a minute about prices. So let me give you a, a, a look at what's going on with pricing across the country. I, I couldn't see the question. I know another one popped up here, Tristan. Is that something we want to? Yeah, let's, uh, that popped up by, I think it's Jessica. What's up, Jessica? How you doing? All right. It's, it's interesting to hear the neutralizing theory affirmed. That's been my thought in listening to the data the last few months. Yeah. I love that. So let's look at prices real quick. So what I have for you here is just a graphic of uh, what I'm going to call nine experts and what they're forecasting uh, for future home prices. And you can see eight of the nine are forecasting positive appreciation uh, going into the next 12 months. One still the outlier there uh, at 1.1% depreciation. You know, I think it's fair to say that the the majority of experts are saying we're going to see uh, appreciation going into next year. And that was a big question that we had, you know, over the summer uh, is what's going to happen to the future of home prices? Are we going to see, you know, uh, uh, compromise in those? And, and I think very strong projections going into the next 12 months. Now, the interesting thing about this is prices will always be uh, dictated by supply and demand. By and large, across the country, the supply of homes on the market is compromised because of the number of people that want to purchase a home right now. We know demand is being driven by white hot interest rates. And so that is very, very um, interesting. You know, the forecast for interest rates is to remain low. So I think as you bring this information to your local market, say, okay, this is what's happening in the U.S., but, you know, depending on what you see in your local market, it's going to give you uh, a picture of supply and demand and, and what you can tell your clients. Now, I mean, I actually agree with this. So here's so that you can see kind of my, my point of view here. And I, I agree with Fannie Mae and Zillow, everybody. Uh, with the way that the world is in the United States in general is really shifting into this whole world that we've got. Uh, I think a lot of sellers are very skeptical about what's really truly going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have them say, well, you know, I'm just going to wait this out. I'm going to stay in my home. I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to add the pool. I'm going to refi. The interest are really interest rates are really low. Right. Yeah. I'm going to fix up this room. I've always wanted to add this over here. But what happens is you wait a year and a half out when the vaccine is fully out, if it takes that long, whenever it takes. You've got to put that into play and say, okay, what happens when the world starts going back to somewhat normal? You're going to have those people that were scared yeah. and say, okay, now everything's back to normal. I'm kind of tired of my house because I've been stuck here forever. Let's sell it. You're going to have that those amount of people coming out and selling. And I think that's when the market's going to more neutralize and we'll see what happens after that. 
Yeah. yeah. It'll be interesting. I think it's like pent up demand 2.0. You know, we saw some pent up demand over the summer, people that couldn't get out this spring. Oh, but I agree. Yeah. As good as good news comes out, you're going to see people say, we want to do something now for a yeah. lot of reasons, right? Um, life is too short. We've been in our house too long. We have different needs. I mean, the, the, the list goes on. And I think we will see a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of folks out there. Uh, doing oh. different things. Remember, you With called the, it, man. You your team did the data, right? It takes it takes the team. Sure, absolutely. Your team did the data. You called it. You said, "Hey, look, this is V shape based on everything that we're seeing." So I, I love that. Now you're calling it. You know, let's say I, I saw that curve going up. I would I would say that that same slow curve that we saw for unemployment is probably gonna be very similar to a real estate curve if there was one, right? Just on, on prices going up like that. Cause there's no yeah. like fall off of a cliff type thing anywhere no. in the near horizon. No, I, I think there's, there's two things we wanna look at. One, we wanna look at the overall economy and then we wanna look at the real estate economy. I, I think the thankfulness and the gratitude we need to all have is, is our business has, has moved forward very, very well through uh, this this economic crisis caused by a health crisis. And again, we all remember uh, being at the epicenter of it in 2008. Um, but I, I think as we go into next year, and I, I've got some interesting, uh, you know, data to share with you as well about that going into next year. Ooh, I want to see that, dude. Yeah, let me, let me no, give you this uh, one, you you know, one, one piece here from Fannie, Zillow, and CoreLogic. The major adjustments that have been on for, uh, home price forecasting have been up. Fannie... Uh, came from 0.4% to 4.4. Zillow said, hey, we're going to we're gonna see depreciation. Now they're saying we're going to see appreciation in CoreLogic, probably the biggest outlier saying we're going to see 6.6% depreciation and, you know, now now forecasting appreciation. And I think they'll go higher than that uh, going forward. Uh, so, but, wait, wait, David, so if we can, if we can read anything into this, it's like, don't trust Zillow. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I'm, I'm, joking. I'm, not, I'm, joking. I'm not saying that exactly. We use a lot of their information. My, my, my point is that all of them have said, hey, we, we, we think supply and demand will be compromised through this. And they've, they've, they've turned around and said, you know what, we see a strong market going forward for a lot of different reasons. Actually, you're, you're right. And that's, that's one cool thing that, that I, I was watching as David and I were doing these webinars from the beginning. It's that everything was changing so quickly. You'd have one yeah. company say, no, no, we're heading to disaster. And then all of a sudden, a month later, they're like, wait, wait, we're not heading for right. disaster. We just changed our minds. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of cool because they don't even know what the heck is happening next. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's very interesting uh, to, to so, watch. You know, the, the, the one thing the CEO of CoreLogic says, on an aggregate level, the housing economy remains rock solid despite the shock and all the pandemic. So I think we're seeing a lot of information. Certainly we know across the country, folks are seeing demand and seeing uh, great things happen in our business. And, and I think we can take some comfort in that, that uh, we see a rock solid business. Now here's the interesting thing. You mentioned it just a minute ago. Okay, what, what about recovery? You know, we talked about a V shape and certainly in the housing market, we've seen a V shape uh, relative to the dip down and the, and the spring back up. Now, I find it very interesting that we sit here, you know, the first, uh, you know, what is it now? Today's the eighth, you know, the, the start of the second week here in September, looking to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, so as we look to the end of the year, this comes from Lawrence Yoon from NAR. Uh, and it says Yoon forecast existing home sales to ramp up to a, it's actually a pace of 5.8 million in the second what? half of this year. That expected rebound would bring the full year level of existing home sales to 5.4 million, a 1.1% gain compared to 2019. Who would have thought we'd be sitting here in September after, you know, what we talked about this summer and in the year we've had saying we have a chance to beat last year's numbers relative to existing home sales. Pretty amazing. That's pretty, amazing. pretty insane, man. But that just, that just shows you that the housing market for right now is doing really well. And it has a lot to do, I think, still with what you said at the beginning, which is that lack of inventory along with the demand because of the low interest rates. That's yeah. a great, great combination. Yeah. Yeah, sure, surely bodes well for our business. You know, the, in the, as we look at, um, you know, that, that green bar there, that represents 2021. And, and he goes on to say home sales will ramp up again next year, increasing between 8 and 12%. Dude. So, 
Um, very, very interesting as we start to cross the line into 2021 and start to look forward. Uh, I think forecast wise, we're seeing uh, some, some good information uh, being shared relative to what the market will look like going into next year. And, and when we come back to, to, together in a couple of weeks, I'll bring some information on the election and just how that's impacting our business and what will that okay. mean going into next year. Not, Are we gonna certainly not from a, a party or political bent, but what, what do we know historically and how is that affecting real estate? God, I was wondering if you were going to bring in Kanye West into this. But, uh, <laughs> well, you're, he's, you're, you're near him in L.A. Get him on here. We'll do that. I've seen him a few times out here. So, <laughs> yes. Okay, a couple questions before I let you go. Yep. Jessica, first of all, Jessica, thanks for always being on these, by the way. And you have such great questions. Uh, do you have any updates on supply chains or new home construction material costs? It sounds like those costs will be pushed onto consumers as a, a possibility. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things. I'll give you some anecdotal evidence of that and some, some data-backed evidence of it. The first piece of anecdotal evidence is we came home yesterday and um, our refrigerator uh, was, was not cooling. And I called today to have somebody come out and look at it. And they said it'll be a week and a half before we can get somebody there because so many people are, you know, need help with their appliances. Now, that's, that's not new, new homes, but I think the number of people building and the number of people right now renovating is through the roof. So you're yeah. seeing uh, a demand challenge with people getting uh, supplies for new homes. We're absolutely seeing it in the price of lumber. Since, since uh, we started this pandemic, the price of lumber has doubled. That will absolutely be passed on to, uh, to the consumer. Now, the challenges for that, my hope is that we're able to, to work through. It's, it's a couple challenges. One, in, in lumber specifically, mills had to shut down during the COVID you know, time. And they, they have, uh, a lot of them have not reached full production capacity coming out of that. So we're still having challenges. So I, I think for the short term, you're seeing supply challenges. I think that will absolutely be passed on to the consumer. All right, love it, dude. Thank you for answering that. I answered the other question. Okay. Uh, there was another thing here, um, but I don't know if you know this. How does the home sales report by Yun reflect or anticipate appreciation? What, what, what well, that was just a report on, on existing home sales. Now, uh, appreciation, we can look back and say, okay, you know, most experts are forecasting, you know, 4% plus going into next year. But if we're forecasting demand and, and a rise in that, that's going to bode well for appreciation. Perfect. Perfect, dude. All right, let me get any questions I've got on Facebook. I think I answered the Facebook questions. We've got, dude, you know what? I wonder if, if we could bring in like, uh, I'm trying to just think if we could bring, cause you're awesome at bringing in this amazing information. What if we could bring in a psychologist at the same time? <laughs> I'm just throwing stuff out there. Right? I, I, think, I, I think the people science of this is a big yeah. piece. If we could bring like a, yeah, a people science person, somebody who says, Hey, look, this is where the country is, but let's take a look at where they're heading mentally along yeah. with the information that you've got. I think we could have a really cool thing going on. I'm going to have to find one. If you know one, send one my way. Yeah. Uh, and then we could do like a, a, a webinar with all three of us just one time. So we could do that. Yeah, I, I, think, the, I think understanding that, and again, we, we bring a lot of data here. We deal with a lot of data. But I think your point, Tristan, is we're dealing with people. We're dealing with emotions. And being able to um, uh, convey what we're talking about the right way uh, is what our job is right now. Dude, I appreciate you, and I know the industry appreciates you and Keeping Current Matters. So everybody tuning in, go take a look at Keeping Current Matters. If you don't have it, sign up. It's like 25 bucks a month, which is insanely low. So if you don't have it, just do it right now. David, thank you again. You're awesome. Everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, David. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye, buddy. Thank you so All much. All right. Bye, have everyone. Have a great day. Take care.